Open your Bibles up this morning, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're back to the Sermon on the Mount again this morning. And now to the second of the six contrasts that Jesus draws between himself and the prevailing religious authorities of his day, the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus, as the messianic king, is drawing this contrast between what was considered an acceptable level of righteousness in order to receive entrance into Messiah's kingdom, as taught by the scribes and the Pharisees, and the true level of righteousness that one must achieve to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The difference is startling, to be sure. It's a difficult text before us this morning. The topic is difficult. I guess last week was no picnic either, was it? It'll be difficult again next week. Jesus seems to have an ability to put his finger on the sore spot of all of our lives, doesn't he? He does it because he loves us. Because he wants us to understand spiritual truth. To not settle for mere externals going through the motions, however good and noble those might appear. He does it because he wants us to recognize that in and of ourselves we do not have the level of righteousness necessary to enter into his kingdom. And that our only hope is to throw ourselves upon his mercy and faith, believe that he took our guilt, our sin upon himself on that cross. And that by his death he atoned for our sin fully and completely. And by his resurrection, he has conquered sin and death for all time. And that by faith in him, we too can receive the life of God in our own soul. Everlasting life. That's what it's all about. The religious authorities of Jesus' day, the scribes and the Pharisees, were content to practice an external form of righteousness. They were scrupulous about it. They went down to the, to the nth degree in their keeping of the law. They tithed the smallest of household spices. They weren't playing around. They were very, very serious, and they were very good at it. And yet Jesus says in Matthew 5 and in verse 20 that unless... You have a righteousness that passes theirs. You will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, in this sermon, is piercing through the facade that so many people erect about what it means to be righteous. He's breaking through the the notion of external conformity to the law of God is all that is required. And he's drawing out really the true meaning and implications of God's law. My friends, God has not changed. The old covenant has passed away, to be sure, in Christ. We are not under the Mosaic law any longer. But as the Mosaic law revealed who God really is and, and, and how holy he is and, and what he expects, that hasn't changed. It's not that the God of the Old Testament is, is some sort of hard or harsh or, or unbending, unyielding God, and the God of the New Testament is more like Santa Claus, warm and fuzzy and easily negotiated. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
He is exceedingly holy, and we are not. I've entitled this morning's sermon, Slaying Sexual Sin. Slaying Sexual Sin. This is a topic that we can all relate to and benefit from. But it's not an easy topic. It's not an easy topic. Our society is awash in sensuality, and the church of Jesus Christ is not immune. Sexual sin is a large problem among those who profess allegiance to Jesus Christ. And it knows no boundaries. It doesn't matter whether you're a a man or a woman. It doesn't matter whether you're young or you're old. It doesn't matter whether you're a pastor or not. It knows no boundaries. One measure of our culture's addiction to sensuality is the grip that pornography has upon us as a people. There was a time when sexually explicit material was somewhat relegated to the fringe. Seedy areas of the city, bookshops and video places. That's not true anymore. With the advent of the internet, pornography of the most vile kind is a ready pipeline into our homes and into our pockets through smartphones. It is constantly with us, or at least the temptation. There's no getting around it. And there's no turning back the clock. Let's just cut off the internet, right? You might as well throw away your telephone. There's no turning back. As Christians, we, we must learn to, to live in the world in which God had his, in his providence placed us, but we need to learn to live as lights among those who are in darkness. And this is one area where the church, his reputation is not good. Not good. A few statistics for you to just give you an awareness. Maybe some are not aware. Constantly, it sort of amazes me how people put their head in the sand and are unaware of the magnitude of the danger. Forty million Americans are regular visitors to Internet porn sites, which according to one report I read said that there are 4.2 million, 12% of all websites are pornography. 40 million regular visitors. One third of those regular visitors are women. And that number will continue to rise as our culture spirals down into the deep dark descent of man. It's only going to get worse. 26% of all visitors are between the ages of 35 and 49. 90% of 8 to 16 year olds have viewed online pornography. 90%. That's your children. That's your children. 37% of pastors admit to pornography as a current struggle. Four in ten admit to it. Every second, porn users worldwide spend over $3,000 on the consumption of pornography. It is a massive business. Beloved, we are drowning. 
We are drowning in a cesspool of perversion. And the gospel is our only hope. It is our only hope to escape. The text before us this morning deals specifically with the sin of adultery. But there is a principle behind this text that transcends that specific sin. We're after that principle. In fact, from Jesus' words here in Matthew 5, verses 27 to 30, we can craft, I believe, a twofold strategy to employ in our fight against sexual sin so that we're able to overcome it. Beloved, we have to overcome it. This is very, very serious stuff. We have to overcome. Not in our own strength, but in the power of the indwelling Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit. God's people are called to be holy. We have to. We have to. The first part of that strategy is to recognize that the fight is eternal. Correct myself, internal. To recognize that the fight is internal. It's an internal fight. Let me read the text. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Stop right there. Jesus has just previous, previously to this exposed the sin of murder, the sixth commandment. He has said that, that the source of murder is, is not just the conduct. It's, it's not about whether you've killed a man or not. That the real issue is the attitude that you have towards your fellow human being and the anger that motivates one to lash out and kill them. Here, Jesus is going to expose the fallacy in thinking with regard to the seventh commandment. Thou shall not commit adultery. And what he is going to say to us here is that it's not just about the action, the external behavior that the issue is way deeper than that. To be righteous is not just to avoid the overt sin of adultery, it's to deal with the lust of the heart. That's where we have to go. We have to go down deep. Perhaps it would be helpful to just define a couple of terms. The word adultery. What is adultery? Specifically, biblically, adultery is sexual intercourse by a married man or woman with someone other than their wife or husband. That is the biblical definition. Sexual intercourse with a man or a married man or woman with someone other than their husband or wife. This is to be distinguished from the sin of fornication. The sin of fornication, Greek word pornia, we get the English word pornography. Fornication is illicit sexual intercourse between an unmarried man and woman. That is fornication. Jesus is talking here specifically about adultery. But he's going to take it down deep, and when he does, it's going to sweep it all up in one big net. The message of the Bible is exceedingly clear with regard to the wicked sin of adultery. 
exceedingly clear. To take another man's wife is wicked, even in the eyes of the pagans. It is something that has been wired into the human conscience by the fact that we we bear the very stamp and image of God. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 20. Let me demonstrate that to you. Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20 is a sorry account in the life of Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, the father of the faithful, indeed our father in faith. A very sorry account indeed. Abraham is is journeying around in in verse 1 in the land of Canaan, surrounded by pagans and afraid for his life. He is convinced they will kill him and take his beautiful wife. And so he has this strategy he has concocted, which is that she is to tell anyone who inquires that she is his sister. And that's what happens. The pagan king, Abimelech, takes her into his harem, believing her to be Abraham's sister and not his wife. God intervenes to prevent Abimelech from touching her, appearing to him in a a dream and rebuking him. Verse 6, God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this, and I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Interesting expression, the integrity of your heart. You took her into your harem with every intention of engaging in sexual intercourse with her. But you did so because you thought she was his sister, and at the paganism of your day, harems were something that was common, certainly among those in power. But when you realized she was his wife, you restrained yourself. Jump over to verse 9. After this encounter with God, verse 9, Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. That is an amazing confession on the lips of a pagan king. What in the world were you thinking? Everyone knows you do not take another man's wife. What in the world are you thinking? Job, contemporary of Abraham, likely, says in Job 31 and verse 11 that adultery is a heinous crime. Heinous crime. Proverbs chapter 2, go ahead and turn over there. Proverbs 2 says that adultery is the path of death. There are two paths in the book of Proverbs, the path of life and the path of death. The path of life is the path of wisdom, lived in obedience to God. The path of death is to reject God and the world as he has created it. Chapter 2, verse 16. The father writes, verse 1, my son, 
the father writes to his son these words to deliver him from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters with her words. The one who leaves the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. Son, listen. Her house sinks down to death, and her tracks lead to the dead. None who go to her return again, nor do they reach the path of life. It's an incredibly frightening statement. Son, listen to me. You walk down this road, and it will take you straight to hell. It's as personally destructive, Solomon says, as, as hugging a burning log or putting your bare feet on top of the Weber. Proverbs 6, verse 27. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. It is personal destruction. To go down this path. You might as well reach into the burning fireplace and grab a big old log and wrap your arms around it. Take off your shoes and dance a jig on the hot coals. Adultery is a crime that cannot be overcome by restitution, the Proverbs tell us. There are many crimes in the Old Testament in which the criminal could make restitution for their action. This is one in which there is no restitution. Verse 30. Men do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is hungry. But when he is found, he must repay sevenfold. He must give all the substance of his house. The one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He who would destroy himself does it. Wounds and disgrace he will find, and his reproach will not be blotted out. Why? Because jealousy enrages a man, and he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not accept any ransom, nor will he be satisfied, though you give many gifts." Listen, if somebody breaks into your house and they steal your flat screen TV, they can make restitution, can't they? They can buy you another one. Under the law, they could buy you seven. What are you going to do when you take a man's wife? What are you going to give him? What would you do when you take a wife's husband? What are you going to give her? You can't give back what you've taken. There's no restitution. None. The Mosaic Law prescribes death. Leviticus chapter 20. And verse 10. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10. If there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Be put to death. It is a capital offense. That's how seriously God takes this sin. 
It is the death penalty. Back to Matthew 5. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said, your teachers have told you from the time you were a child, as you have sat in the synagogue week after week after week, you shall not commit adultery. It is the seventh commandment. But I say to you, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. My friends, that takes all of the heavy stuff and drags it to the secret place. Do not think just because you have not committed the external act that you are righteous. That somehow you can check it off. Seventh commandment, got it. Jesus says the issue is not settled like that. We don't get off the hook that easily. It requires an examination of our heart. And when we examine our heart in light of the Word of God, all is not well. All is not well. When the seventh commandment prohibited the act of adultery, it also prohibited the lustful looks and thoughts that lead up to that behavior. Everything that leads up to it is prohibited just as much as the outward activity. Furthermore, by focusing on lust rather than the act of the adultery, Jesus widens the implications here of the seventh commandment to all sexual sin. See, when he pushes it inside, when he, when he says the issue is really lust in the heart, by doing that, what he says is that the seventh commandment prohibits not just the act of adultery, not just the, the overt and outward sexual intercourse of a married man and a married woman. It prohibits everything that leads up to such actions. That scoops up fornication. That scoops up uh, all of the sexual perversions and the things that that titillate. It scoops up all of the wicked thoughts that occupy my heart and mind and yours. They are all swept up. The seventh commandment is wide and it is deep. And we all fall short. We all fall short. Jesus places the battlefield upon which this struggle must take against sexual sin, not on the outside, but on the inside, right? It's not about what I do and I don't do. It is ultimately about how I think. about others. Listen, you cannot love someone you are lusting after. They have become an object for your own personal gratification, a wicked gratification. When it's on the inside, nobody sees it but God, right? You sit there looking all pious on the outside and inside. The mind is is an active factory producing one lust after another. Listen to me. By the time it breaks out into the open, it's too late. You have lost. 
If you wait to engage the enemy until it is broken out into the open, until it has become an external action or activity, you have already lost the fight. You understand that? It's too late at that point. The issue is inside where where nobody but God and you know what's going on. That's why ultimately no one can fight this battle for you. You must fight it alone in the power of God. But fought in the power of God, we are not alone. Amen? Amen? Amen. Listen, James says, each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed By his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. It's inevitable. Once conception has occurred, it is only a matter of time until the sin baby is born. And conception occurs where nobody but God and you know about it. Listen, we're going to understand sin. We need to understand how it works. There is a pattern to sin. There's a process that brings about human behavior. Not just sinful behavior, by the way. All human behavior comes about according to a process. And the process occurs every single time. We may or may not be aware of the process occurring, but the process is going on. It's what produces human behavior. It goes like this. It begins in the mind, we think. It begins in the mind, we think something. From the mind, it goes to the affections, we desire something. From the affections, it goes to the will, we decide something. And from the will, it goes to the behavior, we do something. This is the process. We think, we desire, we decide, and we do. Let me give it to you again. We think, we desire, we decide, and then we do. That's the process. What we think is good, we desire it. It captures our affections. What captures our affections, we necessarily decide to pursue. That is, our will becomes captivated. What captivates our will determines our behavior. We will do it. We will do it. What that means, beloved, is that the fight has to occur way back at the beginning of the series. It has to begin back with what we think. That's where the fight is to be had. In the mind, what we're thinking. We have to change what we think. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul says it this way, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The fight occurs internally in the mind. Used to be an old expression in the computer industry. I don't know if it's still true or not. But it was something like this, garbage in, garbage out. That is that if you mess up the program or you put in the wrong data, the output is trash. It's unreliable. What's true of the human mind? Garbage in, garbage out. You fill your mind with trash and it will produce trash out through your hands.
Beloved, we can very confidently say that whatever feeds the imagination will determine a person's path in life. Whatever feeds the imagination will determine a person's path in life. That which they think about will ultimately determine that what they do. There's no getting around it. That's why the Apostle Paul can say in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, finish it for me. Dwell on these things. Dwell on these things. Or in the words of the psalmist, Psalm 119. How can a young man keep his way pure by keeping it according to your word with all my heart i have sought you do not let me wander from your commandments your word i have treasured in my heart that i may not sin against you it's an internal fight it's an internal fight The second part of the strategy is we have to believe that the fight is essential. We have to believe that the fight is essential. We have to recognize that it is an internal fight, and we need to believe that it's a fight worth having. In fact, it's essential. It's essential. Matthew 5 and verse 29. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Gouge out your eye, he says, cut off your hand, if that's what it takes. Why did Jesus choose right eye and right hand? Well, we don't know for certain. We do know this, that 90% of the world is right-handed. That would give it its most general application, wouldn't it? The loss of the right hand would be a very severe loss. Some commentators think that perhaps the loss of the right eye refers to the issue of a soldier in battle who holds their shield in their left hand and hides their face with it, thus covering their left eye and leaving only the right eye exposed. The loss of the right eye makes one an impotent soldier. Well, maybe true. I don't know why he says it. But he focuses on the eye and the hand. We can say it this way. The look... And the activity, the eye and the hand. And he says, listen, if if the look or the activity leads you into sin, and since sin results in judgment, it would be better to go about life blind and crippled than to be healthy in this life and burn eternally in the next. In other words, lust has to be dealt with decisively. That's the message. Lust must be dealt with decisively, for for failure to do so will result in eternal condemnation. Twice he says it, verse 29 and verse 30. Your whole body thrown into hell. He has made this an essential fight. The Apostle Paul picks up that idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. First Corinthians 6 and 9. He 
says to the church at Corinth, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Why does he say that? Why does he say do not be deceived? Like an obvious conclusion would be is that it's possible to be deceived about these matters. We can deceive ourselves about these things. We can be deceived about the state of others with regard to these things. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Verse 11, such were some of you. Such were some of you. But you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. At the cross of Jesus Christ, even these Wicked sins can be forgiven. But they must be forsaken. Do not be deceived. The author of the letter to the Hebrews, in Hebrews 13, verse 4, he says the marriage is to be held in honor among all. And the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators And adulterers, God will judge. God will judge. Jesus is using the language of hyperbole here, Matthew 5. Gouge out your eye, cut off your hand. This is the language of hyperbole. He is not prescribing that the way to, uh, to go after lust is to gouge out an eye and to cut off a hand. If it were only that easy. The struggle against sexual sin is an internal struggle. Therefore, external actions by themselves cannot and will not carry the day. It's not just as simple as cut off your hand, gouge out your eye. But it doesn't mean we are to be passive. It doesn't mean that we are to be passive in this this fight. He is communicating seriousness here. This is a serious fight. It is so serious a fight that, that radical action is called for in order to win. How radical? How about gouging out your eye and cutting off your hand? That radical. That radical. Romans 13, verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Make no provision. Cut off your hand. Gouge out your eye. Do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes. The time that remains, I... I want to go through a few things, a few ideas with regard to applying the seriousness of Jesus' words. It starts this way. First, listen, we have to deal with pornography. We must deal with pornography. Listen, if you are not presently struggling with it, someone in your family is. The statistics are just too high. If it's not you, it's someone. And it may be somebody that you wouldn't have thought that. It's that serious. It's that widespread. Put a password on your computer. 
purchase some, some software to, to screen out websites. Don't be alone with your computer. Put it in a family room, you know, where people are always there. Put it in the kitchen. Put it in the dining room. Put it in the living room. Put it somewhere where everybody will see what's on the screen. Turn off the Internet at night when you go to bed. Parents, turn off the Internet. Moms and dads, Check your, your children's smartphones periodically. Well, I don't know how they work. Well, then you should. Or don't give your one to your children. They have access to the Internet 24-7 on a smartphone. You know that, right? 24-7. Alone at night, laying in their bed, they have access to a gigantic pipeline of sewage. And you'll never know. Create an open atmosphere in your home where you can talk to your children and they can talk to you. Tell the people in CNC who are struggling listen, you need to tell the one person you're most afraid to tell. That's who you need to confess to. You need to come out of the darkness, and the way to come out of the darkness is to go to the one person you are most afraid of confessing this to and then confess it to them. Well, I could never do that. Well, here's a knife then. Why don't you just cut your hand off and gouge out your eye, and we'll call it good. Find a friend who will ask you hard questions. Face to face. And most importantly, pray. Pray, 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 and saturate your mind and heart with the Word of God. Go to Romans chapter 6 and read it and read it again and read it again and read it again and memorize it until you become conversant with Paul's statements there. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are now a slave of righteousness. You do not have to give in. If you do, it's because you chose to. It's because you chose to. In the same way you came to Jesus Christ by faith, you must appropriate the power of the indwelling Christ by faith, and he will break your bondage. Indeed, he has broken your bondage. You, nearly, you merely now must appropriate what he has already purchased for you. I numbered these, so I guess I'll number them for you. Number two. That was all number one. Had a lot of subpoints, you know. <laughs> number two. Not everybody reacts to visual images in the same way. Not everybody reacts in the, in the same way. You need to know yourself. If a, if a certain image is, is enticing you to lust, then you need to run away from that image. You need to know yourself. If there's a certain billboard, a, a certain movie trailer, a certain magazine in a, a supermarket, I don't know what it is. If there's some image that is, that is causing you to lust, you need to turn and run away from that image. And it's not about, well, it doesn't bother my friend. First off, you don't really know whether it's bothering them or not because they're lying to you. It's all about you in this matter. You have to fight the fight. You have to win. And you have to turn and run away. Listen, my wife and I, we don't window shop. Okay, we don't window shop. We don't go to the mall or, you know, whatever, Victoria Gardens, and, and just sort of walk around peering in store windows. The reason we don't do that is because all it does is frustrate me. Why in a world would I want to look at a bunch of stuff I cannot have? Right? So I don't do it. 
Do not window shop with sensuality. Listen, you got catalogs coming to your house that have pornographic pictures in them? Stop it. Cancel. Cancel. Well, but I might not know about a sale. Cut off your hand then. <laughs> I mean, we rationalize this stuff away. Run away. Listen, I'd say this, and I've said it to a man before. If, if on the way to work, the, the route you're driving to work takes you by a billboard, and the image is on that billboard, entice lustful thoughts in your mind, then you need to find another way to go to work. No, but I can't do that. It would take me 10 miles out of my way. Then drive 10 miles out of your way. Cut off your hand. Gouge out your eye. What is the price of your soul worth to you, man? Another 20 minutes on your commute? Quit your job if you have to. That was two, three. Ladies, ladies, please, please consider your brothers in Christ when you get dressed in the morning. Huh? What are you trying to do? I know you don't understand. You're not moved in the same ways. I get that. What are you trying to do to us? We live in a culture that is saturated in sensuality. Why would the church of Jesus Christ just adopt it? Listen, if you have any doubt about what you're about to put on, whether it's modest or not, ask your husband. Or if you're at home, ask your father or an older woman in the church if you don't have a father with a reliable sense. What I am saying to you is that if you are not careful in how you dress, you will cause your brother in Jesus Christ for whom Christ has died to fall into sin and to put his soul in jeopardy. And how in the world is that loving him? Yeah, but I want to dress the way I want to dress. Yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem. You care only about yourself. Please, do not let your freedom become a stumbling block for your brother in Christ. Young men, You can help each other. You can help each other by, by developing some kind of a code word. Eyes. I'll use that one. I'll suggest that one for you. You just need a code word so that when someone observes a, a person or a thing that, that presents temptation into sensuality, they can just say eyes and all the rest of the brothers know what to do. Check out your shoelaces, right? Check out your shoelaces till the coast is clear. I don't know, that kind of sounds stupid, doesn't it? <laughs> Beloved, it's our soul. It's our soul. Will we not help one another? That was number four. Number five. Husbands and wives. Husbands and wives. You can help each other in this matter by investing regularly into your marriage. To the intimacy that the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 
is a right and a responsibility of marriage. Wives, you can help your husbands. I know you're tired. I know you're distracted. I know the kids are a nuisance. I get it. But you can help. You can help. Husbands, you can help your wives. According to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 7, it cuts both ways. A regular, God-honoring time of marital intimacy can help. Wouldn't you do that for someone you love? Oh, I'm sure there are many more. Many more. Listen, this is a fight that we have to win. This is an eternal, internal fight. This is an essential fight. This is a fight with eternal consequences. We have to win. We have to win. May God grant us grace in Christ, and yea, he has. Let us appropriate it. Let's pray. Our Father, there is not a one of us who will walk out of here this morning unscathed, unwounded, for your word cuts deep. It is a sharp as a two-edged sword. It penetrates deep within. And our Father, it reveals the depth of our depravity. Oh Lord, there's not a man or a woman, a boy or a girl here. The sound of my voice who has not sinned in this way. Oh Lord, we know the temptations for this sin are always with us. The, the fight never ends. And yet, oh Lord, it's a fight we have to have. And it's a fight we have to win. But Father, help us to appropriate our riches in Jesus Christ. Let us saturate our minds upon his word. Let us fight off those thoughts when they first show their ugly head. Let us not take them out and entertain them. Let us show them the door like an unwanted guest. Oh God, I pray for Foothill Bible Church. And I pray, O oh Lord, that we would be in reality what we are in principle, a holy people. We cannot do it on our own. But with Christ, we can win. We ask you to help us now in Jesus' name. Amen.